Chapter 3, Learning Objective 2. Explain the use of and prepare the adjusting entries required for prepaid expenses, depreciation, unearned revenues, accrued revenues, and accrued expenses. At the end of an accounting period before financial statements can be prepared, the accounts must be reviewed for potential adjustments. Now this review is done by using what's called an unadjusted trial balance. The unadjusted trial balance is a trial balance where the accounts have not yet been adjusted. Here's the trial balance of Big Dog Car Works from Chapter 2. This is an unadjusted trial balance because the accounts have not yet been updated for the adjustments. We'll use this trial balance to illustrate how adjustments are identified and recorded. Adjusting entries record adjustments and ensure that the balance sheet and income statement faithfully represent the account balances for the accounting period and help satisfy the matching principle. There are five types of adjusting entries. They include adjustments for prepaid assets, unearned liabilities, plant and equipment assets, accrued revenues, and accrued expenses. Accrued revenues are revenues that have been earned but have not been collected or recorded. And accrued expenses are those that have been incurred but haven't yet been paid or recorded. Let's start with the adjustment of any prepaid asset accounts. Remember, a prepaid asset is the result of the company paying an expenditure in advance and will be expensed over more than one accounting period. An asset or liability account requiring adjustment at the end of an accounting period is referred to as a mixed account because it includes both a balance sheet portion and income statement portion. The income statement portion must be removed from the account via an adjusting entry. So recall from our work in Chapter 2, there was a transaction where Big Dog paid for a 12-month insurance policy that went into effect on January 1st. Our T account shows a current, unadjusted balance of $2,400 based on the original entry that included a debit to prepaid insurance and a credit to cash. At January 31st, one month or $200 of the policy has expired or had been used up, and this is calculated as $2,400 divided by 12 months. The adjusting entry on January 31st to transfer $200 out of prepaid insurance and into insurance expense includes a debit or increase to the insurance expense and a credit to prepaid insurance to decrease the balance of the prepaid insurance asset. Now we can see the balance remaining in the prepaid insurance account is $2,200 after the adjusting entry is posted. This $2,200 balance represents the unexpired asset that will benefit the company for future periods, namely the next 11 months from February to December 2023. The $200 transferred out of prepaid insurance is posted as a debit to the insurance expense to show how much insurance has been used up during January. Why is the adjusting entry for insurance so important? Well, if the adjustment wasn't recorded, the assets on the balance sheet would be overstated by $200 and expenses would be understated by the same amount on the income statement. Next, we have an adjustment for unearned liability accounts. Recall that on January 15th, Big Dog received a $400 cash payment in advance of services being performed, $300 for January and $100 for February. This is recorded via debit to cash and a credit to unearned repair revenue, leaving us with an unadjusted balance of $400 in the unearned revenue T account. This advance payment was originally recorded as unearned since the cash was received before the repair services were performed. At January 31st, $300 of the $400 unearned amount has been earned. Therefore, $300 must be transferred from the unearned repair revenue into repair revenue via this adjusting entry. A debit or decrease to unearned repair revenue for $300 and a corresponding credit or increase to repair revenue on the income statement. After posting the adjustment, the $100 remaining balance in unearned revenue, $400 minus 300, represents the amount at the end of January that will be earned in February. If this adjustment wasn't recorded, unearned repair revenue would be overstated or being too high by $300, causing liabilities on the balance sheet to be overstated, and of course revenue would be understated or too low by $300 on the income statement. The next adjusting entry is for plant and equipment accounts. Plant and equipment assets, also known as long-lived or long-term assets, are expected to help generate revenues over the current and future accounting periods because they're used to produce goods or supply services or used for administrative purposes. The truck and equipment purchased by Big Dog Car Works in January are examples of plant and equipment assets that provide economic benefits for more than one accounting period. 
Because plant and equipment assets are useful for more than one accounting period, their costs must be spread over the time that they're used to satisfy the matching principle. For example, the $100,000 cost of a machine expected to be used over five years is not expensed entirely in the year of purchase because this would cause expenses to be overstated in year one and understated in years two through five. So the $100,000 cost must be spread over the asset's five-year life. The process of allocating the cost of a plant and equipment asset over the period of time it is expected to be used is called depreciation. Depreciation is calculated using the actual cost and an estimate of the asset's useful life as well as its residual value. The useful life is an estimate of how long it will actually be used by the business, regardless of how long the asset is expected to last, whereas the residual value is an estimate of what the plant and equipment asset could be sold for when it's no longer used by the business. There are different formulas for calculating depreciation, and we'll cover those in a later chapter, but for now, we'll use the straight line method of depreciation, calculated by taking the cost minus the estimated residual value divided by the estimated useful life of the asset. The cost minus estimated depreciation value in the numerator is known as the depreciable cost of an asset. And by dividing that depreciable cost over the estimated life of the asset, we're employing the straight line method of depreciation. To record depreciation, depreciation expenses debited and a contra account called accumulated depreciation is credited. A contra account is an account that's related to another account and typically has the opposite or contradictory balance to the normal balance that it's related to and is subtracted from the balance of its related account when reported on the financial statements. Accumulated depreciation records the amount of the asset's cost that has been expensed since it was put into use. It's an accumulation of all of the individual depreciation adjusting entries and has a normal balance that's a credit which is subtracted from a plant and equipment asset account on the balance sheet. Now don't worry if this seems a little confusing right now, it'll hopefully make sense soon. The goal in recording depreciation is to match the cost of the asset to the revenues it helps generate. Depreciation from an accounting perspective is often misunderstood by introductory accounting students. Many people relate depreciation to a drop in value of an asset, like when you buy a car and drive it off the lot, it loses its value or depreciates. Accounting depreciation has little to do with the market value of an asset or vehicle. It's simply a way of spreading the purchase cost of the asset over the time we expect to use it and to stop when we reach a value that we think it'll be worth when we expect to sell or dispose of it in the future. The adjusting entry to record depreciation includes a debit or increased depreciation expense and a credit or increase to the accumulated depreciation contra account. When we subtract the accumulated depreciation account balance from the plant or equipment balance, we have what is called a carrying amount or net book value of the plant and equipment asset that is reported on the balance sheet. So for Big Dog Car Works, at January 31st, 2023, from our unadjusted trial balance, we have the following two plant and equipment assets, equipment with a balance of $3,000 and a truck with a balance of $8,000. Recall that the equipment was purchased for $3,000 in the entry that debited the equipment asset and credited cash. The equipment was recorded as a plant and equipment asset because it has an estimated useful life greater than one year. So let's assume its actual useful life is 10 years or 120 months, and the equipment is estimated to be worth $0 at the end of its useful life. This means we have a residual value of zero. Applying our depreciation formula then, we would take the cost of $3,000, subtract the estimated residual value of zero for a depreciable cost of $3,000, and divide by the 120 month useful life to end up with a depreciation expense of $25 per month. Note that depreciation is typically always rounded to the nearest whole dollar since depreciation is not exact, but based on estimates of the residual value and useful life. Now we can record the journal entry with a debit or increase to depreciation expense for equipment for $25 and an increase or credit to accumulated depreciation for equipment of $25. Illustrated with T-accounts, we see that after this entry, the debit balance of our equipment asset is unchanged, but we have a credit balance of $25 in the accumulated depreciation T-account for equipment and a debit balance in the depreciation expense account for equipment. For financial statement reporting, 
the asset and contra asset accounts are combined or netted out against each other to result in a net book value or carrying value of the equipment on the balance sheet shown as $2,975, which is the $3,000 cost minus the $25 accumulated depreciation. So why do we even bother with an adjustment for depreciation? Well, if the depreciation adjustments aren't recorded, the assets on the balance sheet would be overstated and the expenses would be understated on the income statement, causing net income and ultimately retained earnings on the balance sheet to be overstated as well. Note that land is also a long-lived asset, but it is not depreciated because it does not get used up over time, and land is often referred to as a non-depreciable asset. Now let's calculate the depreciation expense on the truck. So recall the original purchase entry for the truck included a debit of $8,000 to the truck account and credits of $5,000 and $3,000 to the bank loan and cash accounts respectively. This resulted in an unadjusted debit balance of $8,000 in the truck T account. Let's assume the truck has an estimated useful life of 80 months and zero estimated residual value. So at January 31st, one month of the truck cost has expired since it was put into operation in January. Using our straight line method depreciation calculation, we take $8,000 original cost minus zero residual value divided by 80 months for depreciation of $100 per month. And we'll record this with a debit to the depreciation expense account for the truck and credit to the accumulated depreciation contra account for $100. Showing our resulting key accounts, we can see the truck balance remains unchanged with a debit of $8,000. And we have a credit of $100 to the accumulated depreciation account for the truck and $100 in the depreciation expense account for the truck. For financial reporting, the asset and contra asset accounts are combined or netted out, resulting in a net book value or carrying value of the truck on the balance sheet of $7,900. That's $8,000 original cost minus $100 in accumulated depreciation. The next adjustment is for accrued revenues. Recall that revenues that have been earned but not yet collected or recorded are considered to be unearned revenues. For example, a bank has numerous notes receivable from its customers and interest is earned on the notes receivable as time passes. At the end of an accounting period, there would be notes receivable where the interest has been earned but not collected or recorded. The general adjusting entry for accrued revenues includes a debit to some receivable account and a credit to a revenue account. For Big Dog, assume that on January 31st, $400 for repair work was completed for a client, but it had not yet been collected or recorded. We would record an adjustment with a debit or increase to accounts receivable for $400 and a credit or increase to repair revenue also for $400. This results in a balance in accounts receivable on the balance sheet now of $2,400 debit and a balance in the repair revenue T account of $10,700, consisting of the $10,300 in revenue already recorded plus the accrual of $400. If this adjustment was not recorded, assets on the balance sheet would be understated by $400 and revenues would be understated on the income statement by the same amount. The last type of adjustment is for accrued expenses, or those that have been incurred but not yet paid or recorded. A common example is for a utility bill received at the end of the accounting period that's not likely payable for two or three weeks. Utilities for the period have been used but not yet paid or recorded. The typical journal entry for accrued expenses includes a debit to an expense account and a credit to a payable or what's called an accrued liability account. For Big Dog Car Works, the January 31st, 2023 unadjusted trial balance shows a $6,000 bank loan balance. Assume it's a 4% 60-day bank loan dated on January 3rd. This means that on January 31st, 28 days of interest have accrued. January 31st plus January 3rd equals 28 days. The maturity date is March 4th, 2023, calculated as 28 days in January, plus 28 days in February, that's 56, plus four additional days in March to get us to March 4th. The formula for calculating interest when the term is expressed in days is interest equals principal times the interest rate times the elapsed time in days divided by 365 days in a year. We divide by 365 because the interest rates are always quoted as annual rates. 
For Big Dog, the interest accrued at January 31st is calculated as $6,000, which is the loan balance times 4%, times 28 divided by 365 days, which equals $18. And we can round that to the nearest whole dollar. To record this adjustment, we will debit or increase interest expense for $18 and credit or increase interest payable for $18. This adjusting entry enables Big Dog to include the interest expense on the January income statement even though the payment has not been made. The entry creates a payable that will be reported as a liability on the balance sheet at January 31st. Now we have a T account balance of $18 debit in the interest expense account and an adjusted balance of $18 credit in the interest payable account. On February 28th, we have another interest accrual to make, so we can repeat that entry. And since the number of days for the loan has been outstanding happens to be the same 28 days for each month, the amounts are the same as well at $18. Then on March 4th, when the bank loan matures, Big Dog will pay the interest and principal and record this entry. There will be a debit to the interest expense account for the four days in March, which is calculated as $6,000 times 4% times 4 divided by 365, or about $3 rounded. We will debit the interest payable for the $36 that have built up for the interest accrued for January and February, $18 per month. We'll debit or decrease the $6,000 loan payable amount, and to make our journal entry debits and credits balance, we'll credit or decrease cash by $6,039. The $36 debit to interest payable will cause the interest payable account to go to zero since the liability no longer exists when the cash is paid. Total interest expense recorded on the bank loan was $39, $18 expensed in January, $18 expensed in February, and $3 expensed in March. The interest expense then was matched to the life of the bank loan. Another adjustment that's required for Big Dog involves the recording of corporate income taxes. In most jurisdictions, a corporation is taxed as a separate entity from its shareholders, and so for simplicity, let's assume that Big Dog's income tax due for January 2023 is $500. So we'll record an entry that includes an increase or debit to income tax expense and a credit or increase to income tax payable, both for $500. When posted, we have adjusted balances of $500 debit in the income tax expense T account and $500 credit in the income tax payable T account. This adjusting entry enables the company to match the income tax expense accrued in January to the income earned during the same month. Now that was a lot, so let's summarize the five types of adjusting entries. First, we have an adjustment for prepaid assets by recording a debit to an expense account and a credit to a prepaid account. Second, we adjust unearned liabilities with a debit to an unearned liability account and a credit to revenue. Third, we adjust plant and equipment assets for depreciation with a debit to depreciation expense and a credit to accumulated depreciation. Fourth, we adjust accrued revenues by recording a debit to a receivable account and a credit to revenue. And fifth, we adjust for accrued expenses with a debit to an expense account and a credit to a liability account.